Nope. <laughs> nope. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Jennifer Lee, Abdul Rahman Alkas, and Evan Gibbons' presentation about a sustainability assessment method of 3D printing with bio inspired design. Take it away. So, hi, thank you all for co coming today. We see a lot of familiar faces. So, we're very excited to introduce to you our capstone project that we've been um, working on for a year and a half. So, my name is Jennifer Lee. I'm Evan Gibbons. I'm Abdul Kass. And our capstone project is a system sustainability assessment method of additive manufacturing with biomimic restructures. So I'm going to kind of walk you through an outline of our presentation. So we're going to start by an introduction, explaining what additive manufacturing is, then um, our problem statement, and then talking about uh, biomimic restructures, and then going to our literature review, research objectives, uh, methodology, and conclude with our results. So, according to American Society for Testing and Materials, additive manufacturing is a process of joining materials um, from 3D models, um, layer upon layer, instead of subtractive manufacturing techniques. And usually this occurs within three basic steps. They, um, first, we make like a computerized 3D model which is then sent to the additive manufacturing machine where it's read and executed and then the part is built layer by layer. And then there's also, you gotta keep in mind that there are many different additive manufacturing methods. Um, some are binder jetting, uh, sheet lamination, power bed fusion, but we're gonna focus mainly on the power bed fusion. So this is a video of a additive manufacturing process of um, power bed fusion. Uh, mainly, specifically, selective laser sintering. Direct metal laser sintering, also known as DMLS, is an additive manufacturing technology that creates metal parts directly from 3D CAD data without the need for tooling. DMLS utilizes a variety of metal and alloy materials, such as stainless steel, cobalt chrome, and Inconel to create strong, durable parts and prototypes. DMLS is an excellent choice for functional metal prototypes, high temperature applications, and end-use parts. The DMLS process begins in the same fashion as other layer additive manufacturing technologies. A program takes 3D CAD data and mathematically slices it into 2D cross-section. Each of these sections will act as a blueprint, telling the DMLS machine exactly where to center the metal material. The data is then transferred to the DMLS equipment. A recoder assembly pushes powdered metal material from the powder supply to create a uniform layer over the base plane. A laser then draws a 2D cross section on the surface of the build material heating and fusing the material. Once a single layer is complete, the base plate is lowered just enough to make room for the next layer. More material is raised from the cartridge and recoded evenly on the previously sintered layer. The DMLS machine continues to sinter layer upon layer, building from the bottom up. As the part is built, support structures are added to give supplemental strength to fine features and overhanging surfaces. The completed part is then removed from the base plate and treated with an age-hardening heat process to further harden the part. Any support structures are also removed at this time. With numerous surface treatment and hand polishing options available through service providers such as Solid Concepts, DMLS parts can be used in highly cosmetic applications. Typical uses for DMLS include tools and manufacturing aids, small integrated structures, dental components, surgical implants, and aerospace parts. Okay, so after doing a lot of research on many current additive manufacturing processes, we found like a research gap, a problem that we would like to solve. So for example, if you look at the table sitting in front of you, these are made out of solid structures. 
So we wanted to find a structure that could replace these solid structures using a biomimicry structure, and, but also focusing on the environmental, economic, and social aspects as well. So uh, why biomimicry structures? It's because biomimicry, using biomimicry structures reduces material usage, which then also reduces uh, manufacturing costs, as well as the environmental impact when you process these um, pro parts, as well as um, the en end of life management. So with all these issues with limited designs that are uh, usually in uh, original manufacturing systems, we turn into nature to find uh, bio-inspired uh, geometrical structures. And the main purpose of, so simply biomimicry structures are, uh, are inspired by, uh, by nature uh, geometrical uh, architects. So, the, and then the main reason for that is that they could help us uh, uh, improve the economic, social, and environmental impact of building uh, multiple products. And here are some examples of biomimicry structures. You can see here uh, honeycomb structures, seashell structures, and snail structures. And these are just few of many, many uh, different structures that are, fo uh, are found in nature. Although the implementation of biomimicry structures in additive manufacturing is relatively recent, uh, historically, ad, uh, biomimicry structures have been uh, applied in multiple industries. Uh, for example, spiral stairs, which you can see everywhere, are based on uh, snail structures. The, the Pantheon in Rome, in Italy, which was built over 2,000 years ago, was based, uh, when it was built, the architects that built it was uh, based uh, its uh, architectural shape on the seashell structures. The National Stadium in Beijing in China, which was built in 2008, uh, is based on the bird's nest structure. And this is just to show that the implementation of biomimicry structures could, could take uh, form in variety of shapes and in many, many uh, different industries. And um, as for the, its implementation in additive manufacturing, there are four main purposes that uh, they started to use it uh, to build uh, modern uh, products. And the main uh, purposes are improving the softness of the uh, final products, improving the material reduction costs, and improving the uh, friction reduction and temperature control during the process of building products. Uh, in our literature review, um, we, we noticed and observed that previous academic work has been concentrating on uh, the, the processes of additive manufacturing and materials. The, uh, while there is very limited uh, work when it comes to the structures that are used to build uh, these products. Uh, there is also limited work when it comes to comparing and contrasting multiple processes and structures based on the environmental, economic, and social impact. And this is the research gap that we found and we're trying to fulfill in this project. And so our research objectives were we had three main ones. Uh, firstly was to identify uh, different types of geometric structures as well as their product applications. Um, secondly would then to assess the functionality and sustainability of those structures through their um, environmental, economic, and so uh, societal impacts. And then finally it would be to implement them through a selected laser centering process as seen in the earlier video. Um, some of our research questions, so we had two main ones. Um, kind of broad. The first one was uh, mostly concerned with how might we uh, develop a process to um, assess the sustainability of the uh, additive manufacturing process and its respective uh, structures. And then secondly, um, how do we compare the complex structures to one another with their functionality and sustainability? So then I'm going to walk you through our research methodology. Our task one started off by identifying biomimicry structures and how they're being used today in um, industry. Then we, after identifying some of the models, we then created a computer-aided design model um, on SOLIDWORKS. And then we were able to then do some analysis on these parts. We used the finite element analysis as well as the life cycle assessment, the life cycle cost assessment, and the social impact assessment on these parts. Um, then we were able to use all the results from these assessments and then conclude with which um, structure perform had the best performance. Um, like as mentioned before in task one, we identified some biomimicry structures. 
the first structure we identified is the diamond structure, where we actually use this as a benchmark for testing. So this is a um, original structure. Then the honeycomb and cellular lattice structure is our biomimicry structures that we identified out of many. There was no um, specific reason why we chose this. We just picked the honeycomb and cellular lattice. But all these structures were identified based on uh, material reduction, porosity, and the stress strain of them. And so part two of the project was to um, develop those 3D CAD models seen here. Um, their dimensions of all three are uh, one inch in height, one inch in length, and uh, half an inch in width. Um, all the outer dimensions are uh, similar to uh, prevent favorability of one structure over the other. And um, now my team's going to pass out uh, three different models representing these. Um, these are slightly larger. They're th um, three inches in length, three inches in height, and an uh, inch and a half in width. Um, they were done so, so the uh, 3D printer's uh, process capabilities um, were not uh, quite to this uh, scale. And those are made out of polymer, whereas these were applied with, uh, had a titanium material applied to them. Um, so with the FEA, well you're probably wondering what is that, fin finite element analysis. Um, largely you're focusing on using a computer simulation to um, predict uh, real world behaviors of the pre uh, those three models. Um, there's two main aspects of this. Uh, they are static and fatigue analysis. With uh, the static aspect of it, you're looking at the um, displacement of happening occurring within that structure based upon uh, an applied force in its respective location. Whereas with fatigue, you're largely looking for the uh, fractures that may occur within the part or uh, catastrophic damage. Um, when and where will that occur within the port with similar process parameters of force value, force location, and more specific to the fatigue is number of cycles. Um, that refers to um, the force value. It's a cyclical uh, loading and unloading of that force on the part. And so for our FEA, um, our applied forces was a 10 pound and 50 pound um, top and side force with uh, the bottom of the part supported for both st uh, static and fatigue analysis. Um, again, the static analysis, we're looking for how much displacement uh, would occur of the deformation of that part. And then for the fatigue analysis, we applied 10 billion cycles to try and represent uh, more or less an infinite uh, lifespan, if you will, again, looking for uh, catastrophic damage within that part. So uh, moving from the uh, fatigue, uh, from the uh, finite element analysis, we, may, we obt uh, obtained a life cycle assessment which is basically to analyze the all inputs and outputs of, this, of the system as well as the environmental impact of building these uh, projects. And for this life cycle assessment, we had three main stages. We have the goal and scope, the life cycle inventory, and the impact assessment. Uh, for the goal and scope of, the, of this life cycle assessment, our goal was basically to analyze the environmental impact of using uh, laser selective centering uh, with biomimicry structures as well as original structures and comparing, to, uh, comparing them to each other. Uh, while we have a functional unit of one part, as you can see in front of you, they were the built uh, prototypes. Uh, and for the system boundaries, we have inputs of uh, raw materials, which is a, a grade two titanium powder, and the output would be the three printed, uh, 3D printed part. Uh, the computer system that we used, or the computer program that we used to uh, perform this analysis was called Sustainable Minds, and Sustainable Minds is an online database that is used uh, to compare and contrast uh, the environmental impact of different manufacturing processes. And uh, it has a, a scoring system of uh, millipoints, and it's basically a proxy measurement for comparing multiple uh, products to each other. And what a, a millipoint system scoring uh, is basically is to represent the, com uh, the contribution of a single uh, functional unit uh, in, in, in terms of its environmental impact as, as a whole, uh, as a part of the entire economy, whether this impact was direct or indirect. <coughs> Uh, as for the life cycle inventory, again, we go with the uh, material uh, properties. And for the material properties, we considered uh, for the uh, grade two titanium powder, the yield strength, the elastic modulus, the tensile strength, the thermal expansion, and the mass density. As for each structure, uh, since we have three different structures that we based our models on, uh, we have the mass, volume, density, and weight. Uh, and uh, as, I, as uh, my partner mentioned, each uh, product would have a different weight based on the structure that was applied. 
uh, again, on also uh, the first part of the, uh, of the life cycle inventory was the uh, material parameters. The second part is the process parameters, and they're basically the, the specifications of the machine. And for the machine that we used, we have four main uh, specifications that we concentrated on, which are basically the accuracy of building uh, the product, the uh, laser power, the laser wavelength, and uh, the speed of building a single product. Uh, after obtaining the life cycle assessment, we moved to a uh, life cycle cost assessment, which is basically a techno-economic analysis. And for, the, for this life cycle cost assessment, we had two parts that go into it. We have the machine uh, cost, and then we have the material cost. Uh, for the machine, there are two main categories. First is the purchase and maintenance cost, which go throughout the entire lifespan of the machine. And the second part is the operating cost. And the operating cost has two factors. The first one is uh, the wage of the operators that are uh, operating the machine. And in this case, it's the mean wage for uh, an, an average mechanical or industrial engineer. As the second factor is the energy consumption, and in this case we use the industrial rate for energy consumption here in, in Virginia. The second part of the life cycle cost assessment is the material cost, and it has two parts of it, which is the mass of the product, and uh, as mentioned earlier, each product has a different weight, so a different mass, so based on the MAC, on that mass, it will have a different uh, uh, cost and the price of the powder of the uh, of the powder of the material in this case it's uh, in this case it's a grade 2 titanium powder and since we are using an rational cost it's going to be dollars per kilograms the third main point is the processing time and the processing time we did not make a separate category because it's a combination of both it's a combination of the machine and the material uh, parameters so uh, depend on, on the speed of building a product using the machine and the amount of uh, material that were used, we can determine the processing time of building a single product. So after the LCCA, we conducted a social impact assessment as well. Um, we wanted to identify some pros and cons that we found with biomimicry structures. And some pros that we found were that biomimicry structures were, had the ability to streamline um, supply chain as well as um, build complex geometric structures, like which allow for customizations of products and their um, individual needs. Some cons that we found is that initially it's very expensive to implement and it's also very difficult because this is usually done on a very small scale production line. But also some safety requirements are still being developed because this is a, fair, a fairly new process and so there's still some room for unknown to exist. And lastly, there is also some room for product variation and quality, um, which is a um, concern. So moving on from methodology to the results of our uh, finite element analysis, uh, beginning with a 10 pound side force. Um, again, so what the important aspect of the static portion of the FEA is, is we're not concerned with the minimum amount of displacement. We're mostly focusing on the maximum amount of displacement and um, for the 10 pound side force, the <coughs> lattice performed um, slightly worse with a larger uh, displacement, whereas uh, the honeycomb performed um, the best with the minimal displacement. Um, for the 10 pound top force, um, similar trend here. Uh, the lattice had uh, a slightly larger uh, displacement, whereas uh, the honeycomb again uh, performed slightly better with uh, smaller <coughs> displacement. Um, for the 50 pound side force, uh, the trend was continuing throughout the study. Um, Lattice uh, had slightly larger uh, displacement, roughly uh, twice that of both uh, either diamond or honeycomb. Um, however, the honeycomb again performed slightly uh, better with the minimal displacement. Uh, moving on to the 50 pound top force, this is where the trend uh, changed on us a little bit. Um, the lattice actually performed um, the greatest, having the smallest amount of displacement, <coughs> whereas now the diamond. Uh, had the largest displacement, having it performing the worst in this respective force and uh, force location. Um, with the fatigue analysis, um, again, we're not concerned with the minimum values, we're focused with the maximum values. Um, but first, let me describe what a damage and life plot, what, what do those terms mean? For the life plot, that's really telling you the number of cycles that that respective part uh, survived based on the applied number of cycles, which in our case was 10 billion. Um, for the damage plot, that was the main metric of interest for this study. Um, where it's telling you um, by how much 
uh, was the uh, part damaged. And so for this, um, the both results for the uh, diamond part, the 50 pound, as you would expect, caused the most damage, um, and both the side and top force with the top force taking uh, on the largest damage. For the honeycomb part, um, the maximum uh, displacement occurred uh, with the, or damage occurred, excuse me, with on the 50 pound side force as opposed to the diamond where it was the 50 pound top force. Um, and for the lattice structure, now this is where our results really became interesting. Um, it was regardless of force value and force location that all the results were um, equivalent, as you can see in the yellow boxes. And um, that was something that was uh, quite interesting and uh, quite uh, unexpected for us um, upon the study. And so this is a summary of just the fatigue analysis of the max values. So although each respective structure may have uh, performed better with a specific force value and force location, uh, the lattice structure by far performed the most uh, consistent and um, given the damage plots seen here. So although the life plots are, were quite similar, um, the damage plots was what allowed us to really see the lattice structure uh, come out on top, whereas um, SolidWorks for their FEA analysis work, um, they use a scale uh, grading based on color, which you can look into um, more uh, specifications on that. But uh, for all intents and purposes, the blue is good and red is bad. So that's why lattice performed um, better for the FEA. Uh, then after completing the FEA analysis, we again we went back to the life cycle assessment and for the life cycle assessment uses, using sustainable mines, there are uh, a point in system of millipoints of the entire uh, environmental impact of each functional unit and it's based on three main categories, the ecological damage, the resource depletion and the human health damage. Uh, as you can see here, the diamond structure, which was the first structure that was uh, uh, evaluated, scored 1.5 uh, millipoints, and the highest uh, contribution was under ecological damage, with global warming taking place as uh, the, the highest category of 0.54 uh, millipoints. The second highest, we thought initially that it would be a resource depletion, but it, it was not. The second highest uh, category was the carcinogens and then the non-carcinogens, where uh, fossil fuels de depletion came third at 0 0.15 millipoints. So this could show you that the most uh, contribution of the environmental impact of building uh, a functional unit using the uh, diamond structure, which is an original structure, uh, goes to global warming. The second uh, structure that was analyzed based on the prototypes was the honeycomb structure, and it scored a little bit lower than what the diamond st uh, structure scored. It scored 1.4 uh, millipoints, and it's it's same same levels. The highest went to global warming, <coughs> however, a little bit less at 0 0.50 uh, millipoints. And then the carcinogens came second, and non-carcinogens came third. The lattice structure. Uh, scored the lowest among all three structures. It uh, scored a, a total of 1.3 millipoints uh, on, on the scoring system for sustainable mines. And, but you can see that it's same trend. The building, uh, so we could, we could come to uh, an initial conclusion that bu when building uh, biomimicry, uh, when bi building ad uh, structures using additive manufacturing, whether it was original structures or biomimicry structures, the highest contribution will be to global warming and then followed by carcinogens and then non-carcinogens that would affect the human health uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of individuals. This is to put it on uh, visual terms. You can see that the diamond scored the highest uh, environmental impact uh, among all three structures, while lattice scored the lowest, which makes it uh, better in terms of uh, environmental impact and in this life cycle assessment. And as we noticed earlier, we had the global warming contribution was the highest among all three structures, so we decided to look into the CO2 emissions of building a single functional unit uh, based on all three structures, and uh, this also contributes to the, to the rising awareness of global warming and uh, greenhouse gases issues. So you can see here that the diamond structure scored the highest uh, among all three structures at 36.1 kilograms of CO2 emissions uh, uh, per uh, functional unit, and then followed by honeycomb at 34 kilograms, 
and the lowest was lattice at 31 kilograms uh, of CO2 emissions per functional unit, which makes it, in, in general, uh, in terms of environmental impact, the best among all three structures. Uh, moving from the life cycle, uh, the life cycle assessment, we uh, obtained our life cycle cost assessment or the techno-economic uh, assessment. And in this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, there are two parts of it. There's the, the processing cost and the material cost. And the processing cost, as you can see here, uh, took the majority of the, of the entire cost of building a uh, the product at an average of about 97% uh, across all three structures. Uh, while the material cost took about 3% uh, an, on average uh, across all three structures. And you can see here that the highest structure um, in building a single functional uh, unit in terms of cost was the diamond structure at $179, uh, followed by the honeycomb at $172, and the lowest was the lattice structure again in terms uh, at $160. Uh, so this uh, could uh, make us realize that the lattice structure is, is the best when it comes to the techno uh, economic assessment and there's actually a significant difference in cost between lattice and diamond almost nineteen dollars per functional unit so imagine if you're building one thousand of them or if you're a big company and you're building a lot of units that would make it a big cost and it could save the company a lot of money so to conclude we can see that biomimicry structures can not only uh, reduce uh, manufacturing costs but as well environmental impact as well. Uh, we can see that biomimicry structures will reduce material usage with, which then will reduce in the energy consumption of the manufacturing plant as well as the product processing time. Um, it, from our research you can see that the lattice structure um, performed best overall and which then proves that biomimicry structures then can perform as well as or um, if not better as original structures that we have today. We also were successful in obtaining a systematic approach for sustainability evaluation of geometric structures of in additive manufacturing. So for future research, research should entertain reconducting this finite element analysis but using different <coughs> applied force values as well as the different force locations. And we also wanted to take a look at the various temperatures. Um, we also recommend testing these structures in laboratories, but actually using the metal SLS um, product. And also research and compare alternate structures because there are many. But we, were, we are proud to announce that Brent and Owen back there is taking on this project um, next year and are gonna focus on the auxetic structure, the bone tissue, and the giant lily pad structure. So to conclude, we would like to acknowledge our advisor, Hao Zhang, for helping us out throughout the year, and also JMU X Labs for allowing us to print those prototypes that you saw, and also um, um, the American Society for Engineering Management, where this work was also presented at the international conference, which was held in Huntsville, Alabama. And also, we would like to thank Mass and Trust. And thank you all for coming. Do you guys have any additional questions? Um, we have a, a no hard question policy. <laughs> <laughs> Please feel free to take more chocolate as well. <laughs> Was there any reason that you guys assumed that, um, I mean, other than the longevity of the resources we have, that resources diplomacy would be the second reason for you're talking about the environmental the life impact? Cycle, the life cycle of the material itself. Yeah, so we thought that since uh, the energy consumption would be relatively high, that would contribute to the to the uh, resource depletion in in the general form, uh, and speci specifically the fossil fuel depletion. However, it wasn't that case. Uh, the the, ca the case uh, here was that the human health damage uh, came second as the most significant category when it comes to the environmental impact of building uh, material uh, products using additive manufacturing. And is that something that's going to be retrospective in the long term? Like, when did you guys realize that health impacts would be a greater issue along the process? So, generally, we, we, were, we were looking into all three categories at the same time. So we just had an assumption that 
the resource depletion would, would take uh, would, would be uh, more significant than the human health damage. However, that wasn't our concern. Our concern was to take the environmental impact in general and compare all three structures to each other. Because we do not have a, a standard that we're comparing them to, we're just comparing them and seeing which one is performing better. Right. So just among all three structures. My question was because I agreed. My thought would go to resources as well. And then, um, because you didn't want hard questions, so I tried really hard. <laughs> 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 um, so I was wondering, how did you figure out the processing cost associated with all three structures? Okay, so the, pr the processing cost for, uh, for the all three structures, as I told you, goes two parts of it. The first part is the, is the machine costs. And this would include the purchase maintenance throughout the entire lifespan and um, the uh, operating cost, which has the, the wages of the operators and the consumption cost. And then the second part would be the material cost. And material cost differs based on the product that you are using. Uh, also, there is the processing uh, uh, time cost, which we, uh, uh, we have in our paper, we have and, and a formula that we use to obtain the processing uh, time cost. However, it does not contribute uh, a lot to the uh, production cost in general. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Dr. McDonald might have a question. He's looking at me. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you all for coming thank today. You. We're done with this. <laughs>